when we open the Word, uh, find out what God has to say about life and about uh, how we're to live, what we're to do, amen, so important. Uh, we finished a few weeks ago, a couple weeks back now, uh, the study in the book of Jude where we're talking about apostasy. In fact, uh, remember that Sunday night I wasn't able to finish, so we're going to finish up a few verses tonight. Um, but I heard something very troubling this week, and I just have to share this, and uh, some of you may not be able to be back tonight, I want to share it this morning. I was listening uh, or reading something actually online the other day, there's a, uh, a fellow named Andy Stanley, he's Charles Stanley's son, you may have heard of him, pastors of a church uh, called North Point, um, they're one of these uh, mega churches, um, and they have satellite campuses, in fact they have a satellite campus I believe in, in Charlotte, that's becoming very, very popular. These individuals uh, hold a lot of influence over people, a lot of influence over Christendom. But he just preached a series called Christian. You can look it up online. You can listen to it for yourself. He's a wonderful orator. Uh, the problem is I've listened to him on several occasions, and, and I, I felt like on several times he's just stepped a little bit far from the Word. So he's preaching the other week on this series Christian, and he made comment about a homosexual individual in their congregation. And we're to love the homosexual, Amen. We're to care for them and help lead them out of that lifestyle. Homosexuals can be converted, amen. Folks, it happens. There's documentation of that all over the place. Now, they're sinners just like we're sinners. When I'm converted to sin, I may go back and be tempted with sin again. Say amen. Doesn't mean I'm still living that lifestyle, but I still may be tempted by it. But this particular homosexual uh, man was married. He left his wife, divorced his wife, hooked up with another homosexual uh, because of that family still going to church, they asked him to leave that congregation. Well, he did, but he went to one of their satellite congregations in the area with that homosexual man at that satellite church. Now, this is in his message. He said he allowed them to serve as a host couple, the man and the man. Someone from that satellite church contacted him and said, listen, this is going on. His only problem with it was that the, one of the men was still married to his wife, was not yet divorced. He talked about adultery, but he said nothing about a homosexual couple being a host couple, that is a greeting couple, at one of their churches. Folks, this influence is going everywhere throughout Christendom. He's on the radio every Sunday night in our area. Why are you telling us this, preacher? Because that's not Bible doctrine. That'll cost people their eternal souls. And this is one of the largest speakers coming up in our country today. And this is happening everywhere. Christian friend, when the Bible's open, we need to listen close. Amen. We need to know what thus says the word of the Lord. And pray for preachers everywhere that they'll have the boldness to declare the whole counsel of God. That they'll tell you the truth. Say amen. 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 Now, <laughs> I said all this and it, you're going to laugh. But I'm delivering the whole counsel of God. Today I'm talking about the compassion of Jesus. Next Sunday's Mother's Day, and then after that I'm going to start a brand new series. The reason I, I believe God led me to this is because there's not only the judgment against sin, but there's compassion of Christ for all men. Amen? He loves everybody. He's concerned about everybody. This picture, I found it online. Actually, I had a little Bible, a children's Bible my mother had given me with this particular uh, picture on it. Uh, Jesus among the sheep and holding the, the smallest among them. Our Lord and Savior is a compassionate Savior. Amen. Amen. Uh, I thought about uh, a, a little story I read about a man years ago named Dwight H. Morrow, very influential man in politics and the such. He had a lot of influential people over his house for this gathering, and uh, a few of them got in a room, and one of the guests that day was a man named Calvin Coolidge. We've heard of him. These influential men got in a room separate from Coolidge and uh, they began to talk about his presidential possibilities and they debated it. One man said he has no flair, uh, no personality. People won't like him. Just so happened that Dwight H. Morrow's little girl, she was six years old, was in the room. She heard him talking about Mr. Coolidge. She said, I like Mr. Coolidge. They said, well, why do you like him? She said, she held up her finger. She had a bandage on it. She said, because he's the only one that asked me about my finger. That's a good definition of compassion, isn't it? 
When you see someone that has a bandage on the finger, you ask what happened. You want to know why. Uh, you want to know what's going on in their life. I believe Jesus Christ cares about everybody in this room today. Amen. He's concerned about our souls, concerned about our bodies, concerned about our finances, concerned about our families. There's not a thing in my life that Jesus does not concern himself with today. Amen. In fact, let's look at this. Mark chapter 8, verse 1. Listen to the Bible. In those days, the multitude being very great that was following Jesus and having nothing to eat, Jesus called his disciples unto him and says unto them, I have compassion on the multitude because they have now been with me three days and have nothing to eat. And if I send them away fasting to their own houses, they will faint by the way, for divers of them came from afar. Listen to verse 4. And his disciples answered him, From whence can a man satisfy these men with bread here in the wilderness? His disciples said, Jesus, this is a great problem. Jesus asked them and said, How many loaves have you? And they said, Seven. He commanded the people to sit down on the ground. He took the seven loaves and he gave thanks. You know what we are to remember? We're to give thanks no matter what we have. Amen. You may say, Preacher, I don't have enough. Give thanks for what you've got. Amen. If you spend more time being grateful for what you have, you have less time to complain about what's lacking in your life. Oh, I got two nods and one head shake and three amens. Amen. But it's true. Listen, he gave thanks. He broke it. He gave it to his disciples to set before them. And they did set them before the people. Verse 7, and they had a few small fishes, and he blessed, and he commanded to set also before them. So they did eat and were filled, and they took up of the broken meat that was left seven baskets, and they that had eaten were about 4,000, and he sent them away. When I read this uh, this week, the Lord just impressed upon me to recognize the consideration Jesus had of these folks' situation. Listen to what he said. I have compassion on the multitude because, first of all, he said they have now been with me three days and have nothing to eat. Jesus understood their need. Jesus knows what I have and what I don't have. He knows what I'm lacking at the moment. Say amen. Sometimes we wonder, does God care? He knew all those folks, how long they'd been there. They had nothing left to eat. Jesus knows your need today. The second thing, look what he says, so important. He said in uh, number two, if, if I send them away fasting to their own houses, they will faint by the way. He understood their future difficulties. Have you ever laid awake at night in bed and thought about tomorrow and what you had to do and, and all the things coming ahead and how will it work out and how will I make it? Jesus knows what's ahead of me. He knows what I'm going to face tomorrow. He knows what I fear out there in the future. Praise God. Number three, put it up. He said, for divers of them came from far. He said, preacher, why is that important? Well, he wasn't saying everybody. He said certain ones of them traveled a, a long ways to get here. L listen, folks, there was 4,000, and he knew which ones had traveled farther than the other ones. I'll tell you something about Jesus. He knows everything about my life. He knows where you're at today. He knows what you're facing today. He knows what you're going through today. Amen. Preacher, nobody cares. Jesus cares. Amen. He understands and he loves us and he's concerned. In fact, Matthew 10, 30 said, The very hairs of your head are all numbered. Dennis, that was short work. You know it was. Amen. <laughs> now, Dennis is my friend. I'd have never said that if it weren't for him. I'm like the old preacher said he told himself when he was young. He said, all, all my life, I said, if I, if I do anything in life, I'm not going to lose my hair or gain weight. He said, if I lose anything, it's hair. And if I gain anything, it's weight nowadays. Amen. He knows the numbers of the hairs on our head. You see, I believe God not only considers us, but he feels for our situation. Well, that's a big difference, amen. I believe he, he feels about what's going on in your family today. What's happening on the job? What's happening in your finances? What's happening in your emotions? He is concerned and he feels for you whatever you're feeling. In fact, the Greek word in that verse uh, for compassion uh, means simply to have the bowels yearn. Now, that's kind of an old English term. It means to feel sympathy, to pity. It, it basically means your insides feel for the other person. Have you ever had it, and I'm sure you have, when someone else is hurting around you, you kind of feel what they feel, amen? 
You ever felt someone that was around you and you felt their awkwardness and you were concerned for them? You felt their pain and you hurt for them? Sometimes I'll have people around me after church and, um, and they don't have anywhere to go out to lunch and nobody to go out with. Sometimes they'll mention out loud, uh, boy, uh, nice day to go out to eat. <laughs> That's a hint, folks. Amen. Some of you are hard of hearing. Amen. And they'll say things like, uh, where are you going? I'm not going anywhere. That's a hint. Amen. Now listen to me. Listen to me. Do you care about that hurting soul? I'm going to tell you, Jesus Christ only cares. He feels that hurt. I believe he felt their hunger that day. He felt their bewilderment. He felt their, uh, their needs. And, and I believe God feels for us today. He needs concern for us and our situation. Say amen to that. The word compassion, the definition is twofold. Listen, it's a feeling of deep sympathy and sorrow for another who is stricken by misfortune. It is important to feel for other people in their need. Amen. But it, it doesn't end there. Listen, it's also accompanied by a strong desire to alleviate the suffering. Compassion is not just feeling bad for you, but it's wanting to do something to help you. In fact, Jesus told his church in the New Testament, he said, don't just look at someone that's hungry and in need and say, be warmed and filled. He said, but minister to their need. It's one thing to care about a person. It's another thing to say, hey, come on and eat with us. We took a fellow out, and I won't tell you no names. I'll tell you later in person. Amen. But we took him out for dinner last week, and, uh, uh, and usually we're able to bless them, and I thank God for that. And, uh, and my family, I ordered a, a sandwich, and they ordered something small, and it came around to him. He said, give me the salmon. Praise the Lord. Someone's going to bless you. Go big. Amen. And I'm going to tell you something about the devil. He'll try to hinder you. He'll say, oh, you can't afford this. You can't do that. I'm going to tell you, you can't afford not to care about people. You can't afford to be selfish. The most miserable people on this planet are selfish people. Concerned about themselves and all of their stuff and getting more. And I'm going to tell you, you can have everything and be empty in your soul. This week, a former football player, uh, some of you heard about it. Junior Seau, 43 years old, living on the beach, uh, uh, had millions of dollars in his career, took a gun, put it to his chest, and ended his life. Some of us think, oh, if I had money, he had it. If I had fame, oh, he had it. If I had a place on the coast and could hear the ocean, he heard it. But none of it secured his soul from, from taking his own life. What are you saying, Pastor? I'm saying you need to concern yourself with others. Amen. Listen to this. Jesus not only cares about uh, my, my soul, but he cares about my physical being. I believe God cares about my health. Do you? I believe he's concerned with the provisions of our bodies and what we have and finances and things like that. You say, Preacher, does God care about that? God cares about you. But not only our physical, he surely cares about our soul, our spiritual, and our emotional needs. How do you know this, preacher? Hebrews 4, 14. Listen to what the writer says. He says, Seeing then that we have a great high priest, that's a mediator, a go-between, between God the Father and us, we have a high priest, someone that will intercede for us. His name's Jesus. He's passed into the heavens. Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession. He said, For we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Jesus is not cold and unfeeling. Jesus cares about what I'm going through today. Say amen. In fact, I, uh, I understand this a little bit. My daughter, my wife, uh, such a good woman. She's, my wife's very clean. That's good to know. Amen. Didn't want a pastor's wife that's very dirty. Amen. She's a very clean person. <laughs> Laugh. It's okay. It's Sunday morning. We got to do something. Amen. Amen. And uh, my daughter's not been well this weekend, and my wife went in there and cleaned my daughter's room. Oh, my goodness, what a task. And uh, oh, she, she invited me in. She said, look, she has carpet. And, uh, and, and we, she cleaned it up perfect from top to bottom. And as I was leaving, I said, well, you know, I understand my daughter because she's her father's daughter. I am a sloppy person. Amen. And, and Brooklyn took it after me. So for me to go in her room and say, how could you let it get? That's hypocritical, folks. I know exactly how it gets like that. Amen. I know exactly how you can live in that. One day the, the pest man was coming to, uh, and I clean up the house when the pest man's coming because you don't want to let your pest guy know you're filthy. Amen. 
Mark that down in your books. And uh, so I'm cleaning up Brooklyn's room. The Lord is my witness. I'm going through stuff. Sean, I found probably seven or eight towels uh, and mixed all the clothes. And, uh, and I found bottles, old water bottles and drink cups. And I found a, a dog. Was it? No, he wasn't. And uh, found all kind of stuff uh, in her room. And, and for me to complain because, folks, listen to me. A very clean person wouldn't understand. Oh, how dare it. But if you know what they're going through. If you know the difficulties they face, say amen. I'm going to tell you something about Jesus Christ. He knows our weaknesses. He knows our, our failures, our faults. Amen. David said he pities us as children. Why? Because he knows we're made from the dust of the ground. God knows what I'm made of. And he's concerned about my needs. Praise the Lord. But not only does he have feeling, Jesus has the power to alleviate our suffering. Look at this, verse 16. Let us therefore come boldly under the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. We can go to God with the expectation of finding help for our needs. Now, does he care about me? He can fix it. It's one thing to say, I care about you. It's another thing to fix my problem. Well, I miss old Jim Gilbreth. Jim lives out in Arizona now. We, I, I was able to pastor him for several years before he moved away. Jim was such a wonderful man. One day I was preaching years ago, and I was preaching about my lawn, and I said, I, my lawnmower's broke down, and it's so big, and I can't cut my grass. I went home that Sunday afternoon, and, and two men rolled up with a brand new riding lawnmower on the back of this thing and rolled it off, and it was mine. The rest of y'all just say, I'm sorry, your lawn's bad. Y'all do nothing for me. You're pitiful's what you are. <laughs> you know I'm teasing. But listen, there's a difference when a man can just say, oh, I'm sorry, and a man can fix your problem. One day I was out in the vestibule with him. He had this leather jacket on. He was doing some financial work for a company that did these, uh, owned some Lear jets and, and jetted people around the country. He had a nice leather jacket on with this jet emblem on it. I said, that's nice. He said, well, try it on. He said, man, it's so comfortable. I tried it on. He said, is it fit? I said, yeah. He said, it's yours. I said, praise the Lord. Hallelujah. It fits real good now. It's one thing to mess with somebody that says, I feel bad. But it's another thing to deal with someone that can fix your problem. I'm going to tell you something about Jesus. There ain't a problem you got he can't fix. Did you hear that? There's not a problem you have he cannot fix. Well, preacher, I'm financially in. God can fix your finances. Amen. Preacher, I got family issues. God can heal my family. Preacher, my body hurts. God can deliver my body out of pain. You see, he not only cares about me, he can fix my problem. Preacher, I'd, I'd serve the Lord, but my mind won't let me. God will heal your mind. He'll help you get a hold of your thoughts. Glory to God. Ooh, I, thank you, Lord. I wanted to do that. Praise God. Glory to God. I believe God is able, don't you? Hallelujah. Just rejoice. If God's ever helped you, just rejoice. God, I praise you right now. Thank you for the times you provided in my life. Fix things I couldn't fix, God. Praise the Lord. Heal me when I was broken, Lord. Touch my mind when I felt like it was slipping away. Glory to your wonderful and loving name. Praise God. Praise God. Hallelujah. I'm going to tell you something about Jesus. He has loving kindness. Ooh, I like that. I like that. Loving kindness. Uh, a little boy was in Sunday school, and the uh, teacher asked him, said, what's the difference in kindness and loving kindness? He said, kindness is if you're hungry, someone gives you a piece of bread. She said, what's loving kindness? He said, if someone gives you a piece of bread and puts jam on it. Amen. I'm going to tell you something about Jesus. He don't just give you what you got. He'll give you something on the bread. Amen. He'll fix your heart when it's broke. He has compassion on our physical needs. Do you believe that? Matthew 20, 29, as they departed from Jericho, a great multitude followed him. Behold, two blind men sitting by the wayside. When they heard that Jesus pass by, cried out, saying, Have mercy on us, O Lord, thou son of David. And the multitude rebuked them, because they should hold their peace. But they cried out the more, saying, Have mercy on us, O Lord, thou son of David. I'm going to tell you something about it. When you get in enough need, you don't care. You're going you're to tell somebody. Some people get... <laughs> Some people are real religious in church, you know, they get real, mm, I wouldn't act that way. I'm going to tell you, if you had a real busting need in your life, you might crawl down on this carpet today. Amen, preacher. When the doc says, I don't know what we'll do for you, I'm going to tell you, you won't be so proud, you won't make your way to an altar, you won't lift your hands, tears won't flow when there's a real need in your life. Religious people are always saying, oh, calm down, calm down. That's because you can be religious when ain't nothing wrong. 
You can't be religious when your heart's broken, your life's tore up, and you're in a mess, and you got a need nobody can fix. The two blind men said, I ain't quitting. Help us, Jesus. Glory to God. Look what it says. Jesus stood still and called them and said, What will ye that I shall do unto you? They said unto him, Lord, that our eyes might be open." So Jesus had compassion on them. He cared about their need. He was brokenhearted for their situation. But not only that, he had the power to do something. He says, And he touched their eyes, and immediately their eyes received sight, and they followed after him. Glory to God. My Savior, when he sees my need, he hears my cry. He not only cares about me, he comes over and he touches me. He says, Gary, I'll fix that for you. I can, I can change your situation. God's a big God. Amen. Mark 1, he preached in their synagogues throughout all Galilee, cast out devils. There came a leper to him, beseeching him, kneeling down to him, saying unto him, If thou wilt, thou can make me clean. You know the story. Leprosy was horrible. When you were a leper in that day, you couldn't stay around nobody. Everybody kind of marked you out. You had to holler out unclean when you got close to a group of folks. I'm going to tell you, there are lepers in our world. They don't have physical sickness, but people have labeled them. Amen. They keep them at a shout's distance. They don't want anything to do with them. Oh, I love Jesus. He, he was moved with compassion. He put forth his hand. Did you hear that? He put forth his hand to touch a leper. Jesus is not afraid of touching you where you are. Everybody else may run away, but Jesus comes near, and he'll, he'll draw near to your situation, into your life. I, I tell you, one of the things I love about our church, we love everybody. I don't care if you got money, got no money. We got cars out there that are real nice. We got cars that duct tape hold together. Say amen. I see some people roll in, and as it clatters in, I'm worried a door might fall loose. Thank God. Thank God. I want them to feel as welcome as the guy that rolls up in the Mercedes. Say Amen. If you got on a fancy suit or you got on the last pair of clothes you own, thank God, because God loves everybody. Amen. Not concerned about those things. He's concerned about your eternal soul and helping your needs. Say amen. He said, he put forth his hand, he touched him. He said unto him, I will be thou clean. And as soon as he had spoken, immediately the leprosy departed from him, and he was cleansed. God's our helper. God's our helper. Charles Tinker's in the hospital. You pray for Charles. He's supposed to have a surgery on Monday to remove a gallbladder that God will heal him. Sister Lois Passmore needs a touch in her body bad. God is able to heal her. I prayed with her last night, and God can touch her. Say amen. Uh, Sister Dot Ramsey needs prayer in her body. Roger Bradley's battling cancer and needs prayer in his body. There are other people in our congregation. Brother Claude Ayers needs a touch in his body. Many others. God can heal the body. Two things to remember after we read these scriptures. Listen to me. Number one, seek the Lord for help. When you have help, seek Him. The blind men cried out. I'm going to tell you, the Bible says you have not because you ask not. Sometimes we don't have what we need because we never even told God I need it. If you've got a need, cry out to God for help. And when people try to stop you, don't listen to them. Keep crying. Amen. Keep praising. There are going to be people that always have doubt. My mother, to the day she died with cancer, she fought it for 14 years. To almost the day she died, when you'd come in her room, if you'd say something negative, she'd say, well, I don't want to talk about all that. Her pastor came to visit her a couple weeks before she passed, and he was talking in terms of like funerals and stuff. And she said, Pastor, what are you leading up to? You say, Preacher, that's foolish. No, I believe you live every day. The Bible says after even uh, uh, Hezekiah was told by Isaiah he needed to get his house in order, he was going to die. The Bible said he turned his face toward the wall and he cried out to God. He begged God for more life. I'm going to tell you, when, even if you get a message from heaven that says it's over, you can still cry out to God and say, have mercy on me. Heal me one more time. Give me hallelujah. Extend my days. The Bible said the, the leper came and kneeled and worshipped and Sought God out. You've got to seek Him out. Secondly, you've got to know that He's moved with compassion on our infirmities. You know the good thing about Jesus? He wants to help us. You've got a lost loved one. He wants to save them. Hallelujah. Skip the next slide. Skip it. Go to the, the one after that real quick. Can you do that for me? Compassion on the brokenhearted parent and the troubled child. God led me to this. God cares about the brokenhearted parent. He's concerned about a troubled child. 
Mark 9, 17, and one of the multitude answered and said, Master, I brought unto thee my son, which hath a dumb spirit. I got to say it. You ever thought your child had a dumb spirit? <laughs> I got to say it. Amen. <laughs> Several times dumb spirits have crawled on my children, and I... <laughs> I, I, I believe God has a sense of humor. I really do. And whosoever, <laughs> whosoever he taketh him, now listen, let's get serious. He tears him. He foams. He gnashes with his teeth. He pines away. Today the devil wants to destroy our children. And I spake to thy disciples, and they, they should cast him out, and they could not. He answered him and said, O faithless generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I suffer you? Bring him unto me. They brought him unto him, and when he saw him, straightway the spirit tear him, and he fell on the ground, and he wallowed foaming. Now listen to what Jesus did. He asked the father, how long is it since this came unto him? And he said of a child. Jesus wanted to know how long this has been on him. I think that's important. See, I think we pick up, sometimes we pick up things in our youth and our childhood that stays with us all our life. And we're praying about something here, but it's a problem from way back. Did you hear me? I believe there's baggage sometimes that we're dealing with, and, and what we see is the outward result of, but the baggage was when I was a 10-year-old boy. When something was said, when something was done, and it locked in my mind, and it's fought me all my life. And Jesus said, the man said to Jesus, and oft times it cast him into the fire, it, into the waters to destroy him. Don't ever forget the devil's full goal is to destroy you, destroy your child. But if you can do anything, have compassion on us. Help us. Jesus said unto him, if you can believe, all things are possible to him that believe. You've got to stir up your faith. You've got to cry out to God and say, help me. And I love this answer. Straightway the father of the child cried out and said with tears, Lord, I believe, but help my unbelief. You ever prayed that to God? Well, that's a, folks, sometimes you say, I, I believe, but I need to believe more. I trust you, but I want to trust you more, God. Listen what happens. And Jesus saw the people came running together. He rebuked the foul spirit, saying, I like this, Thou dumb and deaf spirit, I charge thee, come out of him. I like this part, and enter no more into him. It's one thing to get delivered. It's one thing to stay delivered. See, God not only wants to deliver folks, he wants to keep them delivered. See, I don't believe you need to get saved and then five weeks later be like you was. Say amen. I don't believe you need to come to an altar and say, Lord, help me. And then a few days later, I'm back in the same pit. God wants you out of that thing, and then he wants you to stay out of that thing. The spirit cried, rent him sore, came out of him. He was as one dead, and so much that many said, he is dead. But Jesus took him by the hand and lifted him up, and he arose. I'm closing, I'm closing. You don't have to put anything more up there. I just want to make a few comments. I remember when Jesus went to a place called Nain, the Bible says, and he saw a big old funeral procession. The Bible records, I think, three times where Jesus went to funerals. Every time he ended up raising the dead. Isn't that powerful? He saw the widow of Nain. Remember, she had her son, her only son. She's a widow. He's on a death by her, death couch, being carried to the, to the grave. The Bible said he saw her crying. He felt her loss. He felt her desperation. And he walked over to that death buyer and he touched the boy and said, you get on up. <laughs> now that's powerful enough. What's powerful to me is that the Lord of glory felt her pain. Jesus cares about you today. He knows your heartbreak. He knows what you're going through. I don't care what it, what it is. And he will help you if you'll come to him, if you'll cry out to him. I want you to stand with me today. Will you do that? Oh, Jesus, I probably don't talk enough about your mercy. I probably don't tell people enough about your great love and concern for us. Remind us, God, of how much you care about us. Remind us, God, that if we'll come to you, you want to help us. Your heart breaks for our situation. Give us faith, Lord. Help our unbelief, God. Help us to trust you more.